Why am I on last night? I didn't have my book. Tell her what? Tell her what? One last one, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the AFC Tennessee. You got it. I feel like the storm's coming from there. Really? I don't know how you can get it. Oh, I have a hole. 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 I have
just something that we've been discussing, right? So increase, decrease for constant. So there's going to be a subtle change to the homework and how I want you to like answer something when they ask for the interval to increase, decrease. And so we'll talk about that today. And then if we need to, we can always go through, is it an even, odd, or a mean? Okay, does that make sense like the first one I want to review? It's kind of like mixing everything we learned together. Okay, but after that, we're going to talk about a piecewise function. Is it like this? No, that's all. Yeah, it just looks wrong no matter how I'm writing. Why before you accept that this thing is broken? Uh, I can definitely think of a lot of words. So piecewise function. Okay. So we're going to talk about piecewise functions. This is a topic that I know for a fact that um, you'll get a lot in calculus, especially at like a way higher level than what I'm about to show you today. But I do want to I do want to go through like the notation, what it looks like, what you're going to be expected to be able to do with a piecewise function. And then the last thing we're going to spend pretty much all of our time on today um, is going to be this idea of what we call a differential quotient. That's what we're going to spend most of our time on today. Um, and I'll explain as we go. And it's going to kind of fit the topics we talked about yesterday. So I'm going to see if you guys can like piece it together and figure it out. Um, any questions with our kind of our goals today? Definitely a lot. So we need to kind of kind of move through this stuff as quick as we can. <coughs> Alright, let's start with just this first item over here. Let's talk about, you know, um, let's talk about a graph here. So So there's my graph. Okay, it's a little small, but we'll go with it. All right. Does it have an x-intercept? Yes. How many? Three. Three. There's three x-intercepts. So when you name intercept, okay, you just give me roughly the number that you're hitting. Now let's say, let's say that was zero. Okay. So what would this number be? One, two, three, four, five, and a half. Yeah. So we go negative 5.5 comma zero. Like that's an x-intercept. Now if you want, you can just give me the x number for the intercept. I'm fine with that. What about the middle one? Zero. zero. Or you can just write zero. And what about the next number? Two minutes. So 2.5 times zero or is the same as your x. Okay, those are x. Bless you. Now what about y-intercepts? There's only one of them, correct? What's the coordinate? Zero, zero. So this would be also the y-intercept. Number. You could just say the number zero. I'm fine with that because that is technically a y-intercept, right? That's the actual number that you hit on the y-axis. But I prefer the coordinates. That makes more sense to me. So that way you're identifying that it's an actual spot that's an intercept. Okay. So questions come to terms on the intercept idea, where you hit the the actual axis. Okay. Min and max. So min and max on this particular problem. What do you think? Does it have a maximum? Yeah. yeah. What's the maximum? Five. Uh, four. So four. All right. So now maximum is four. Now, is that an absolute maximum or relative? Absolute. Nothing goes higher than four. This is the highest point on that graph. So that is an absolute maximum. Now, is there another maximum? Yes. Anytime there's like a little hill, okay, because there was a little bump in the road, like this one right here, there's a little hill top there. That is also a maximum, but it's another type. Now, what number roughly is that? One and a half ish? I say one and a half. One now, the name of that little hill top is a relative maximum. It's anytime you do a little hill. But 
it doesn't get higher than the absolute. So you could have multiple relatives in there. But that one just happens to be a little doubt or a little hold up. Okay, now what about a minimum? Negative one right now. Absolute. Okay. Absolute. Absolute minimum. Is there any relative minimum? No. They're, they're the same one, right? We had the minimum in two different spots. It happened to be the same minimum, so it's, it, it's, only the, it's only the absolute minimum. There's no other valleys that are smaller than that. You don't use the end point for, um, for minimum or maximum um, or uh, for relatives anyway. It could these end caps could be the absolute minimum max, but not for uh, not for relative. Relative, remember, when you're trying to pick a relative min or max, there has to be numbers to the right and left of it. So for like this one right here, um, this is the absolute maximum. This one was the relative maximum because there was numbers to the right and left of it that were smaller than it. But it wasn't the tallest point, so that's why it's a relative. Okay, any questions with the max, max or min stuff? Does that have to be over left and right? So if it's a straight line and ends at a point? That would just be an absolute maximum, right? It wouldn't have a relative in that case. Because it's got to have a hilltop. It's got to be like a curve to it kind of a thing. Or it's got to be something like this, where maybe it does like a V shape, where the numbers around this point are lower, but it's got to have numbers right and left of it. Does that make sense? But if there's another point going up that's below that, That is not a relative maximum. The reason why there's no numbers to the right. Okay? Yeah. So that, does that make sense? Like looking at that picture, has an absolute max, has an absolute min, because um, these look like they're the same. But that does, is not considered a relative max. Because it doesn't does it do a hilltop. There's no like little V over here going on the right. So alright. Um, I should have left that prime on the board. Uh, what, what number are we at? We're at negative one here. So domain numbers on this particular graph. Where do we start and stop for x-axis? Is that six? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yep. So negative six. Now, bracket or parentheses? Bracket. It's a closed dot, correct? What number do I go on the other side? One, two, three, four, five, six. So six. And what do I have there? Parentheses. Now, why the parentheses? Slope and down. Okay. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So that's your domain. Now, if we went to infinities or anything like that, if there are breaks in the graph, we'd have to do unions and whatnot. But this, this graph is pretty flowing if you go left to right, so no worries there. What about the range? Negative one, and that's a that's an actual bracket, correct? To four. Is that a bracket or a front seat? Bracket. Bracket. All right. Domain range. You guys seem like you have that down pretty well. Okay. But now, here comes the goofy part. Okay. Increasing, decreasing, and constant. Now, on this graph, did at any point did it just like flat? Did it go flat? Okay. So there's no constant. It's non-applicable on this problem. This thing goes up and down and up and down kind of thing. So what we need to worry about is on increasing, decreasing, and whatnot. I'm going to change up slightly the answers I want. The reason why is it was a topic that I brought up in the later sections, and I didn't even think about it for you guys. I brought it up for like period four and period nine yesterday. When you're doing increasing, okay, so there's a couple of spots in this graph where it increases, correct? As you go left to right. So it increases. Now, if you can see, how many times does it increase? Twice. It goes up here, and it goes up that direction there. Okay? That's an interval, correct? There's like an there's an actual band where it's going up to the right. That's an increase. Now, what I discussed with the later classes, not with you, um, number one, I, I don't know if I did or not, that's based on slope. 
So I don't know if I brought that up. If, if the slope is positive, right, the line's going up to the right, that's a positive slope, then it's increasing. So does everyone see that it's pointing upward? Okay, that's an increase. Now, how the interval works and how I want this answer, and this is going to be the slight difference as well. Okay? I need the x number, the domain of where, where uh, it's actually increasing. And this is the goofy part. It's, it's just one subtle difference. Okay, so where do we start here? That's a negative six, right? And then it increases until it gets to what? The number three? So negative three. Now here's the slight difference. Okay, I, I agree with the negative six to, to negative three. Negative six to negative three. Now at the negative three, I don't need to put a bracket. That's the slight difference. Okay, now let me explain. The reason why I don't want to bracket at negative three, even though I know that is a solid dot at negative three, right? On the x-axis, right? There's a solid dot there. The problem is with negative three, right here, it's being shared. It's literally shared with the increasing function and the decreasing function. Agreed? It's like it's in the middle. It's that, it's that weird inflection point where it turns, it flips. This is not used for either increasing or decreasing. That's why I'm putting the parenthesis on that. For domain, it's fine. For range, it's fine. But when we talk about increasing and decreasing, the numbers that are shared between when it flips, like when it rotates, we don't include that number. Because it, it's, 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 in, it's the weird in between. Okay, so that's how we're gonna do that. So now over here, it starts increasing right here. <coughs> Actually, we'll put it, it starts increasing like right here. And it goes to about here. So now what are these numbers? So what is this number right here? 2.5. And when does it stop increasing? Uh, what is that? 5.5? Now, do we agree that this spot and this spot are, are being shared between decreasing and increasing, right? It's like, it's the weird turning point. I don't need to include those numbers. So this is going to be a union. 2.5 to 5.5. Now you're probably looking at going, well, they're solid dots. I know they are. But the problem is, they're literally an inflection point where it turns. And I don't want to include that when you're increasing the increasing. It's shared. It's shared between the two. So that's a subtle difference I want to do with the update. The reason why your book, it, um, when you look at the back, they won't include those numbers. So I want to make sure that you're using the same notation as both would. Okay. Questions on that? That's a slight difference from yesterday. Okay, let's talk about decreasing now. Does this graph ever go down? Yes. yes. So we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to make those same changes. So anytime it decreases, it has a negative slope. That's something I don't know if I brought up yesterday. we got to make sure that we're putting that interval. So these are going to be new intervals now. And we're going to do the same thing. We need to worry about the inflection point. So anytime it turns, we don't include that number. So here's where it's going down, right? So what is this interval? Negative three up to up to number what two and a half two point five ish. That's this is the band we're decreasing from here to here. It's not coordinates, it's the band, it's x number. So we're decreasing from here to here. I'm not going to include those numbers. So for decreasing, it's starting at negative three and it's going to two and it's going to positive two and a half. And I'm not going to include those numbers because it's literally the shared point between the between the, the curves. Okay, and then there's another decrease from here to here. So what is this hilltop? What is that number? One, two, three, four, five and a half. Five and a half to what? Six. It's decreasing again. It's going down just a little bit over here. And those, um, the, the five and a half, I know for sure I'm not, I'm not sharing, right? Because I'm already sharing, so I'm not going to put a bracket on it. But what about the six? The very end. Then point. Bracket or parenthesis? Parenthesis. It's an open circle. So that's a, that's a no-brainer. I have to use parenthesis six. So this is the subtle differences right here, using parentheses when we haven't used those before. Because it's, it's an inflection point. I want to make sure that we're good with that. Okay. Questions on this type of problem? That was a slight difference I made from yesterday. Okay. 
Last question with this. Even, odd, or neither? Neither, however you want to pronounce it. So, neither. Why? Why is it neither? Why is it even or odd? What do you remember from yesterday? Say it again? Yeah. It's not, it's not a pretty picture. It's not symmetrical. Like, the right and left side of this graph are completely different. And what I mean by right and left side, I'm using the y-axis and the origin to, like, break the graph in half. So, like, this side over here looks completely different than this side. It's automatically a neither. It's not symmetrical. It's not, it's not balanced. So this graph is not symmetrical. It's a neither type of graph. If it was an even type of function, if it was an even function, whatever happens on this side has to be the same picture over here. So if they do one of these, then over here it has to be the same thing. That's an even function, right? It has to be the exact same picture. Ignore my terrible art that you know. If it was an odd graph, it would have to be the complete opposite. That's an odd graph. Because these are positive numbers, those are negative numbers. Like on either side of the y-axis. Okay, do we see the difference between an even and odd so like graphically? Okay. Okay, let's talk about a piecewise function. I'm just going to do a couple of these, or uh, uh, just one example, but I'm going to do um, a couple different um, options for how this works. All right, for a piecewise function, and we're just going to stick with an easy one for right now. If you've never seen these before, this is kind of a quick intro to it. A piecewise function is when you have a graph that's doing multiple different things in the graph. And that's how they can make very complicated looking pictures by mixing multiple different graphs together, multiple lines, curves, whatnot. Okay? So you can, um, they, they always have the name of the function, they have some bracket, this will have a list of functions in it. So different formulas that we can do. So I'm just going to give you a couple of them, right? So one of the functions is going to be a negative x plus 3. Uh, one of the functions will just be the number 4. And one of the functions will be a 2x minus 1. Right, these are just a bunch of different things. Now, what type of functions are these? Like, if I were to look at that one by itself, what type of graph would that be? It's a line, right? Because it has no power, so it's just a straight line. What about this one? What type of graph would that be? It's a line. It's a line because there's no powers on it. I know it doesn't have a variable, but it is just a line. It's a constant line. It's actually a constant number. It's not just a dot. If it was a dot, they'd give you a coordinate. They don't give me a coordinate because they gave me a line. What is this? It's a line. We're going to have three individual lines. Now, how this works, how you graph it, you need to know the domain of each one of these. That's what's always printed behind it. They have individual domains, like where these things are graphed to, like where they start, where they end. So for the first one, this first graph, I'm going to say the domain is um, all the numbers less than negative 2. So all the numbers less than negative 2, you're graphing this thing. Um, this, for the 4, I'm going to go all the numbers from 1 up to the number 5, and it's going to equal 5, right? And for the last one, anything above 6. Anything above 6 will be the last graph. So there's going to be three individual pictures on this graph from this thing. So let me uh, pull this graph here. Just set this one next to the back this. All right. Okay, so we're going to graph these. So the first one, I know that this thing is limited from negative 2 this direction, right? That's where it's limiting to. So what you can do, there's a couple different ways you can do this. What I would do, I would just plug in a couple different numbers to, to actually graph this thing, to see what it looks like. So one of the numbers that uh, I know that I'm not allowed to use, right, so it has to be strictly less than negative 2, I'm going to plug in negative 2. I'm going to plug it in and see where it's at. So if I plug in negative 2 in here, what's a negative negative 2 plus 3? So if I plug in a negative 2 like this, yeah, this turns out to be a positive 2, right, because these cancel out. And 3, so this would be at 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, am I allowed to use this dot? No, because it, it was not equal to negative 2. I cannot use negative 2, so I'm going to put an open circle there. I'm not allowed to use it. 
But I can use numbers just less than negative 2, like negative uh, 2.1, negative 2.2, negative 2.3, and so on and so forth. Okay, let's try another number. What's another number that's obviously less than negative 2? Um, negative 3. All right, so we're going to plug in negative 3 now. So what's negative or what's a minus or a negative negative three plus three? Yeah, because the negative negative would cancel and that would be six, right? So that would be here. And you get an idea where this thing's gonna go. It's gonna be a line going this way. Right, and it's right. going forever. That could be a solid dot. That's a solid dot because I'm using numbers less than negative two. The only number I wasn't allowed to use was negative two. Yeah. Does that make sense now? Okay. okay. So if you plug in a negative four, you can use that, that'll be a solid dot. If I plug in negative twenty, it'll be a solid dot. The only number I couldn't use was the negative 2. It had to be strictly less than that. Okay, for the next graph, from 1 to 5, that's this band over here, from 1 to 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So in this band here, your answers for this function will always be a constant 4. So from here to here, it's always going to be a 4. So it's going to be a 4, a 4, a 4, a 4, and a 4. Now, notice, was I allowed to use the number 1? No. I wasn't allowed to use 1. It couldn't, it, I could not equal 1 on the x-axis. So that dot's going to be open. The rest of them are going to be solid. In fact, it's going to be a solid line. Right there. Because it doesn't matter what numbers you pick from, from between 1 to 5, it's equaling 5. No matter what number you pick. So pick a number between 1 and 5. Say the answer. 4, okay. So if I pick 4, the answer will be 4. If I pick 3.2, the answer will be 4. If I pick 2.2, if it falls in this band, it, the answer is going to be 4. So that's why all the numbers from negative, or from 1 to 5 is always going to be the same digit the whole time. It's going to be 4. It's not a dot, it's a solid line. It's, like, it's a constant term. Okay, and then the last one, anything above 6. So what do you think my first number I'm going to use? Say it? 6. 6. I'm going to oh, plug 6. Sorry. Even though I'm not allowed to use it, I, I'm going to plug it in and I'll put an open circle there. So I'm going to plug in a 6. So it's 2 times 6 minus 1. 11, right? It's 12 minus 1, which is 11. So, so at the number 6, which I'm not allowed to use, the answer would have been 11, but I'm not allowed to use it. Right? So it's an open circle. But I can use 7. I heard that number. Uh, 2 times 7 minus 1. So that's a 13, so I'll graph that. So at 7, it's at 13. And that graph's going this way. And that's a solid x, because I was allowed to use 7. Anything bigger than 6, I'm allowed to use. There, that, that is your piecewise function. That's the graph. You notice there's breaks in the graph. Those are piecewise functions. I thought I'd better intro those, because we've been using all these graphs. right? We've been doing things with graphs that have different domains, and there's breaks in the graph. But how did they get graphs with breaks like that? How do they, how do they have things where there's gaps, and there's just lines, and there's curves? But they're not connected. It's, this is how they're doing it. They're graphing individual things spaced out. They can be connected for all I care. We'll do more of these on Monday. We'll do more of this stuff, and I'll have you practice a lot. And we'll sort of be graphed over in class, and we'll practice and scale to the graph at this. Okay. Questions, comments, concerns on piecewise? I know it's your first day of seeing that, so it's probably like. Especially like the open circle idea, full circle. Okay. Somewhat, somewhat okay. How much do you think we're gonna need quite a few more examples Monday? Yeah. Yeah. People, yeah. Alright, so we're kind of in the middle there. Alright. Last thing today that I want to talk about. Differential quotient. This is what we're gonna end with today. Alright. Well, let me give you the idea of what a differential quotient is. Differential quotient. There's an actual formula for it. So that's the weird part. Like, most of freak out we don't really have formulas because we can't have ideas, things we look for. But there's an actual formula to calculate a differential quotient. Okay? So what that formula is, this is the actual formula itself. So the differential quotient of f of x is this. Looks mean and complicated. It's really not. The 
especially once you understand what it's asking you for. Okay, so let me explain what this is. Like what you're looking at, and eventually, hopefully, we can tie this together with the topic we've actually discussed this year. Okay, what they're having you do for this differential quotient, for this f of x, okay? They're having you modify the function to begin with. So, how are they changing f of x? What are they doing in this first parentheses? They're adding an h to your f of x. So that would be a slight difference. So that's somehow, this is a modified version of your original f of x. So it's something with a plus h in it. In this part, I need to substitute into my problem. So you'll see one. I'll do one here in a minute. Then what you're going to do is you're going to subtract the original function, the exact thing that you started with. You're going to subtract it off. And what that's doing is it's finding the difference between these two functions. That's why they say it's a differential quotient. You're finding the difference between the things. And then at the very end, we're going to divide by h. Now, let me explain. Why do they put an h on the bottom? Because that seems goofy. Okay. Everything else, okay, you know, we're finding the difference between two different functions. Fine. You're just subtracting functions. But why the h and bond? Because this is what they're doing. This is what they're doing. This is how they're getting just an h on the bottom. So if I if I get rid of this parentheses, what is x plus h minus x? Yeah, it's just h, right? That's just what's on the bottom because the x's cancel out. Now. What you're actually doing here, just so you know, just so you can see this. This part right here has the x plus h in it, right? That's that part right there, and we have the x, f of x. What this is, what you're looking at here, this is a big fancy way of writing this. So, what does that look like to you? Have you seen this before? Yeah, but well, if those x's were different numbers. Oh, Where have you seen that formula before? Uh, the point slope. Oh, you, slope. It's slope formula. That's what you're doing. What a differential quotient is, is you're finding slope for a function. Now, it seems weird, right? Well, slope is an easy number to calculate. But they're having you do it for a function, not coordinates. So they're having you find is your problem increasing, decreasing, staying constant at any point? It's an instantaneous rate of change. That's what you're doing. You're finding at any point on that function, that curve, that line, whatever it is, you're finding the exact slope at any moment. That's important. Okay? That's a huge concept. This, what you're looking at right here, is the main focus of calculus help one. They spend an entire semester on what you're about to look at. I'm going to teach you about five minutes how to do it. But they, get, they take a whole semester talking about it. Okay? So, does everyone understand where this is coming from? Like what we're doing this for? For slope. Okay? Alright. So now let's talk about how this works and why, why is it slope? Because this is goofy. We'll start with this concept first. Just what this thing is. What do you remember from the last couple of days? The function, right? It's the name of a function with a variable in it, right? What this actually stands for, okay, it's the name of a function with a variable x. This thing is just the letter y. It's the y value that's coming out. That's what it is. I mean, that's the fanciest way you can write y. Um, because when they do a graph like this, these are your x's, this is the y's. This is your function evaluated at x's. So when you plug x into your formula, this is the numbers that are spit out of it, the y number. So that's what they're doing here. So what we're doing is we're finding the differences in these f of x's. So they're slightly modifying my graph. So let me let me just give you a simple, a simple function, and I can show you how this works. So this is going to be our function for this first problem. It's going to be 3x plus 2. That's going to be my function, my original function I want to start with. Okay. Now, what type of function is that? Is it a line, curve? It's a line, right? Because it has no powers in the x's, so it is just a straight line. We're going to find slope of it. Now, most of you can look at that thing and know what the slope is. What's the slope going to be? If you
you look at that, if that was a normal equation and now it's blue, black, three, three. This differential quotient will prove that. It'll prove that your slope is three at any point on that graph. Okay, that's what it does. Now, obviously, you're probably going to roll, I mean, why do you need the formula if I can just look at it and tell me the slope is three? Because this is, if you don't know, this is y equals m to the b. And the slope is the m. Which one? So we're going to see what the m is. These are y so we know it's the y axis and the point of the But why would we need the differential quotient to tell slope? The differential quotient is obviously is used for things other than just straight lines. We use it for curves. So like that last one that I did where I had that curve going up and down. We can use this thing to find slope at any point on the graph. So you can tell if it's a positive slope, if it's a negative slope, if it's a constant, that type of thing. Okay, so we're going to do it for this problem right here. So I can so I can show you that, yes, your slope is 3 at any point on this graph. So here's how it works. Um, I'm going to plug this thing, what you're looking at right here, into this formula. That's what I'm doing. I'm using the 3x plus 2. Does everyone understand that? Okay, so how this works, how it's plugged into this thing. The first thing, right here, I'm doing the f of x plus h. So this, I'm, this is in my head. I'm thinking about this. So what I'm doing is I'm plugging in x plus h into that thing. Does that make sense? It's the original function with x plus h plugged in, substituted in like you did in that last homework. So this is the original function, right? 3x plus 2. But guess what I'm plugging in instead of an x? x plus h. Does that make sense? I'm taking the original function, plugging in x plus h. That, what you're looking at right here, this whole thing is this part. That's what you're looking at. That's the f of x plus h part. Now, what do I need to subtract? What do I need to subtract? The original function. So I'm going to subtract the original function we started with. Just the original thing, not modified at all. No x plus h is plugged in. Right? So now it's starting to look like the formula, right? f of x plus h minus the original function. And what goes on the bottom? Okay. Here's your formula. All we need to do now is simplify it. Simple problem now. So how do I deal with how do I deal with this three? Distribute, right? It's gonna, it's gonna go through the parentheses. Alright, so this is three x plus three h plus two. Now what do I do with this negative sign? Distribute. Go back. all over h. Okay. Now at this point, I'm going to add and subtract like terms. So if I add and subtract like terms on the top, x's are gone, two's are gone. And what I'm left with is 3h divided by h. And what happens? What's your slope at any point in this graph? Three. Three. That's what it's telling me. Now you're probably thinking, well, x is good. I should do that in the beginning. It did. This is the line. Lines are easy. Lines don't change. It's the same slope. It's literally constant the whole time. It's the same slope. Going up three over one, up three over one, up three over one. But this differential quotient is not used for this purpose. It's used for curves. Where a slope changes constantly. So let's do a curve. Let's do a problem where it's a little bit more tricky now.
what the graphs look like. Now, do you agree that slope is definitely changing on that thing? It's a decreasing function over here. It's an increasing function over here because of slope. So this differential quotient will tell me what my slope formula is, like how to find slope at any point on this graph. It will give me exact slope. Oh, the slope is 20 at this point. And it's 25 at this point because it's changing. The slope, because if you notice, slope is this way. It looks like it's constant. But eventually, when it nears this, like, this vertex, this point of inflection, the slope starts to change. You can start to see like slope is starting to turn less negative, and then it turns out to be a constant or like flat, like zero slope, and then it starts turning positive slope, and it starts changing slowly by slowly. So there is a difference in change when you hit a curve. And that's what this formula will give you. It'll tell you what the formula is. So the differential quotient, if you want to see this thing, that thing, plug into that formula over there. Okay, so I need to take my original function and plug in the x plus h's in. Agree that's my function with x plus h plugged in. That's f of x plus h. What do I have to subtract? The original function, right? So this thing. And what goes on the bottom? H. And all I need to do is simplify this thing down and eventually, I'll get what my slope is, roughly. My slope, if, if I do all this work, which I'm going to do here in a second, it'll eventually tell me a formula to find slope. It'll eventually give me something like this. Something in the back. Some H's in the back. And I'll explain how that works later. Okay? It'll give me some formula of what my slope is. I can plug in numbers. have this problem written down in case the bell goes off. Yep. Okay, this is what we're going to continue Monday. We're going to try a couple of these. So Monday we need to talk about piecewise functions. We need to talk about differential quotients. I think Like, see how my product, products are doing. 